the 1990-90 phenomenon. Who knows what that stands for? 90% of traders do 90% of their money make it. Yeah, 90%, let's be specific of how it works. 90% of retail traders, so the retail broker's clients, lose 90% of their deposited margin within 90 days. So what is margin? It's the money you put in your account and you get leverage when trading CFDs. But what is a CFD? Well, you don't actually own the asset. CFD is contract for difference. So if you were to buy a CFD on a stock, it's a contract that is supposed to mirror the price of the underlying asset as in the real stock. So when the real stock goes up a point, the contract is supposed to go up a point at exactly the same time. That's what it's supposed to do. So when you're on the platform and you press the button to buy on a CFD platform, you don't own the stock. You own a contract that mirrors the price. And that's why it's called a derivative. Because the price of the contract is derived from the underlying asset. And there's two types of margin. There's the initial margin that you put in your account. And then once you have a position, what we call variable margin. How much your margin is going up and down. How much you're making or losing. Because what happens at the end of the day, if you buy the contract and the stock goes in your favour, the broker pays the difference into your account. Contract for difference. If you have the reverse situation, the broker takes money out of your account if you're losing money. And what happens when your margin goes to zero? You get a margin call. You have to deposit more money in your account, and if you can't, the broker will stop you out of the position, and you're done. Your account's blown up. So that's why we call them contract for difference, because the difference is taken out or put in. Typically, in Forex, obviously Forex is a very popular instrument for a popular asset class for retail traders. Typically in Forex, whatever you deposit in your account, you are allowed to borrow up to 100 times that what you put in your account. So what does that mean? Well, it's 1% variable margin, which means if you lose 1%, it goes to zero. So let's say you put $1,000 in your account. You'd be allowed to take up to $100,000 of risk, equivalent in the currency pair that you're buying or shorting. And if you lose 1%, you're gone. But what if you put 10 grand in your account? So in that scenario, you lose 100% of your margin. What if you put 10 grand in your account and had 100 grand risk? Well, if you lost 1%, you'd lose 10% of your margin. That's how it works. So what do most retail traders do? What do you think the average balance of a retail trader's trading account is in the UK, Europe? So this is in rest of world outside the US. It's a couple of thousand dollars. And what are they doing? Taking $200,000 positions in Forex and blowing up in days. 100 times leverage, we call it. With stocks, commodities, ETFs, you're looking at 10 times leverage. So the numbers work exactly the same. If you lose 10%, you're out. But think of all these guys on the platform trading in the way that we've discussed, in the opposite way, the way the, to the way retail uh, professional traders do it. Wouldn't it be amazing if we ran a company where we could just take the other side automatically every time they traded? We'd win 90% of the time. And this is the big problem. The way the brokerage industry works is that there's major conflicts of interest with, with retail traders. So major conflicts of interest between the broker and their clients, the, re the retail trader. That creates a scenario where that literally happens because those guys want it to happen. The infrastructure has been built not for your benefit. Your objective is to turn up and make money. That's not their objective. Their objective is the opposite to yours, which is to take your money. So the first two conflicts of interest are really obvious. There's four main conflicts of interest. Spread and commission. So spread. What's spread? 
Well, if you buy something, you're buying it in the market, for example, at six. And if you sell it, you're selling it at five. So the broker makes one. You pay the spread. So if the broker has two clients, the broker can buy it at five and sell it to you at six. So one seller, one buyer. They make a spread. So they make a spread on every trade and take turns. We'll use this phrase again in a second. The word turn. Taking a turn is buying something at five and selling it at six. So the spread and commission. So spread happens in Forex. There's no commission in Forex. You pay the spread in Forex. You pay the spread in stocks. But in stocks, you also pay commission. So you'll pay a percentage commission to trade in and trade out. So those two are really obvious conflicts of interest, but everyone tries to ignore them for some reason. So what does that mean? Those two things mean that the broker, by default, is absolutely 100% incentivized by volume and frequency. So they want you to trade in the biggest size possible as frequently as possible. So put two and two together. Why do they lend you 100 times what you put in your account? Because they get paid. The next two are not so obvious. The financing turn and the OTC gain. Does anybody know what OTC means? Over the counter. <clears throat> right, so CFD contracts are over the counter contracts. Okay. And when they take the other side and make money, it's called an OTC gain. First incentive, we'll just get it down now. First retail broker incentive, volume and size. Trading as frequently as possible in the biggest size possible. That's how they get paid. The other two, not so obvious, this is how it works. So the first one, financing turn. Who finances the leverage with brokers? Does the magic money fairy from the sky come down and give brokers money to lend to you? Where does it come from? It comes from investment banks. So if you want to set up a retail brokerage company, get yourself 30, 50 million dollars, go to an investment bank, use that money to collateralize some debt and ask them to borrow 250 million dollars. Ask them if you can borrow 250. You get yourself a revolving credit facility, build a, build a trading platform and then farm out the credit on the platform to retail traders. So you borrow at pretty much now, this will be the case, you borrow at two and three quarters, farm it back out for a point higher. So you take a financing turn on the debt. But what else gets collateralized? How do you get away with turning up to the investment bank with only 30 to $50 million regulatory capital and then borrowing 250? How do you get away with that? Because retail traders are gonna open trading accounts. And when they put their money in the accounts, that money is collateralized as part of the revolving credit facility. And then you're basically putting the money in your account and sponsoring the broker to lend you money at a point higher. So essentially you're financing your own rape. That's how it works. Now of course, if 90% of clients lose money and you wanna take the other side, you wanna borrow as much as possible so you can take that other side. So of course you're gonna lend out as much as possible teach people how to trade as frequently as possible in the biggest size possible, so they pay you, you take a point on the financing, and then you get the gain on the other side when they lose. So retail broker incentive two, provide third party financing with no risk or very little risk, take a turn out the financing, and use the credit facility to encourage retail traders to trade as frequently as possible in the biggest size possible, and take the other side of all the trades. Not a bad business. And again, why are we looking at this? You need to understand the realities of the industry. Step one, this is how it works. Step back for a second and think how long it takes you to open a trading account. Quite a few of you have opened trading accounts before. How long did it take you? Someone shout out. 10 minutes. What did you provide to open the account? Passport, utility bill, so identify yourself, utility bill, 
Confirm address. You are who you say you are. What else did you have to do? You'll sign some terms and conditions because they'll qualify you as someone who's got money. Did you read the small print? Sure, and we're assuming everyone's non-professional. So in the terms and conditions, what are you actually doing when you sign them off? The only line that matters is one line and it'll be in there somewhere. I'm happy to lose all my money. <laughs> and the broker is not, a, and the broker, it's not his fault. Broker's got nothing to do with it. It's a risk disclaimer. I'm happy to lose all my money. So that's all you do. Passport, utility bill, fill out the terms and conditions, sign it off. I'm happy to lose all my money. Then what happens? You've got a trading account. You've got access. A total stranger who's never met you is willing to lend you 100 times what you put in your trading account because you provided them a passport, a utility bill, and said, I'm happy to lose everything. Welcome to the world of retail trading. But what, why are they doing that? Why is it so simple and straightforward? Well, think about the regulators. Passive, don't care. They react. Retail brokers, clearly, with these conflicts of interest, are absolutely incentivized to create a narrative around the infrastructure that increases your chances of losing money. In fact, the infrastructure itself is self-perpetuating. Think about it like this. If you own that company where you've got 10,000 clients and 9,000 always lose money, and you're spending 30 to 50% of your money to replace them every month, the ones that are closing down. What happens when a new guy opens their account? Well, you know you've only got 90 days to rape him. So what do you do? Do you wait 90 days? No, you get on with it. You do it as, quick, you do it as quickly as possible before he disappears. You've only got 90 days to take the money and, make, and take the ownership of that money from his account to your account. So it becomes self-perpetuating. It's a very negative feedback loop. So they're very, very heavily incentivized to make you believe in short-term trading and to trade in the biggest size possible. So they can make the four revenue streams, spread, commission, financing turn, OTC gain. So write them down. Make sure you don't forget them. This is how the industry works. Volume and size is incentives, spread and comp. Third party financing with a turn and OTC gain. And this is what the industry looks like. This is what the trading industry looks like, the infrastructure. On the left hand side, we've got exchanges and investment banks. And everything to the right of that is retail brokers, trading educators, retail traders. We've put a few labels under each. So the investment bank, what are they doing? They're providing the credit facility and clearing to the brokers. And that order flow goes through them electronically down to the exchanges and trades. It all happens within, within less than seconds. What's the retail broker doing? Well, the retail broker, if we skip the educator for a second, the retail brokers providing the access, so platform and software, financing, leverage, and liquidity. Now that's important because without the brokers, you wouldn't have liquidity. So that's the positive that retail brokers provide to retail traders. You can access liquidity that you wouldn't get anywhere else as a retail trader. So what does that tell you? It's a necessary evil to use retail brokerage platforms as a retail trader. You have to use them. We'll come back to that later. But what type of education do you get from brokers? Well, there's an incentive. There's a conflict of interest. You're not going to get education that helps you make money. You're going to get education that makes you behave like a monkey. Press the button as many times as possible per day until you blow up. And it'll be wrapped up in some sort of strategy usually a technical analysis strategy, very short term, less than a day, in hours, in minutes, follow this line on a chart, 
every time, the ch every time this line crosses this line from below, buy. Every time this line crosses this line from above, sell. Signals, very typical. You're not going to get education that works. So they're providing this to the retail trader. What have we called the retail trader? Dumb money. Why? Because they believe everything that the broker tells them. And on the left-hand side, we've got the smart money. In investment bank traders on prop desks. Why do we call them smart money? Because they believe nothing that anybody tells them in the market who has conflict of interest. We'll go into more detail on that later. They do the opposite of the dumb money. What's the retail trader paying? Spread and commission, what are they providing? They're providing the demand for the financing, the demand for the false narrative, and the demand for losing trades. So they're providing the liquidity for all of those conflicts of interest. And we have the acronym there, COI. So if you see that in the presentation later, the acronym COI, conflict of interest. And the education is a false narrative. <clears throat> We're going to go into a little bit more detail on how this works in terms of the OTC game and how all of the conflicts of interest work, how the drivers of conflict. So spread, commission, financing turn and OTC. Believe it or not, it actually happens automatically. It's now all been set up to be automated. It's been going on for seven, eight years already. So if you're only learning this now, you're well behind, well behind. Think of the 10,000 client broker example. What happens when a losing client comes onto the platform and presses the button? Well, at 7 a.m., all the losing clients, whose accounts are down, go into one liquidity bucket, and all the guys who make money go into another liquidity bucket. The guy who loses money comes on, presses the button. They provide the liquidity automatically, instant. Take the other side. They could, if they want, hedge it. They could go into the market, the real physical market, and purchase the physical underlying asset. So then they, they, the brokers short the contract and they buy the underlying asset. But they don't. They stay short the contract. Retail trader loses, comes back, sells the contract back to the broker. Broker buys, closes out the position. Retail traders closed out. Broker's closed out, broker makes money, takes the difference out the account. What have they made on that trade? They've made every revenue stream, spread, comp, financing, and OTC gain. And literally, it's all automatic. It's, a, it's automated software. It happens in a second. So the hedge, if they choose to put it on, will happen automatically down the pipe through the investment bank. It's just a two-way pipe. Now, what happens if it's a guy who makes money? Well, the guy trades, buys the contract on the platform, broker shorts, automatically hedges by buying the underlying asset. The guy makes money, comes back, sells the contract, broker pays the difference into the account after unwinding the hedge. Has the broker lost money? No. So what's the broker made? They've made spread, commission, and financing turn. So they haven't made the OTC gain. What else has happened though? What else has happened in that trade? Look at the green bar. They've hedged. They need money to hedge. Winning clients are annoying for two reasons to the broker. One, because the OTC gain is eliminated. So they only make money on three revenue streams. But two, they have to commit twice as much, as, twice as much capital relative to a losing trader because they have to hedge. So winning guys cannibalize the broker's capital. So they're annoying. Losing traders are fantastic because they get the full revenue streams and they use X capital to trade with that client. <clears throat> winning traders are annoying because they make less money and commit twice as much capital, 2X. So remember this trend over the last 30 years, the monopoly duopoly situation? Where's the credit coming from? It's coming from the investment banks. 
This is the value chain or supply chain of liquidity in the trading and portfolio management industry. Who owns the narrative? Who's the, what's the perfect retail broker to lend money to? One that peddles the narrative. Why? Because the investment bank can lend them money and make money out of it forever. So it's starting to add up. There's a monopoly duopoly situation with exchanges and investment banks. Who are the biggest clients of, of exchanges? Investment banks. More on this later. But smart money and dumb money. This is why we labelled smart money on the professional side, investment banks, prop desks, dumb money on the right hand side as the retail traders. Smart money understand how the financial markets work. They understand conflict of interest. It's professional trading 101. It's the stuff you get taught in your first couple of months at Goldman Sachs or any firm that's good. They avoid trading in the way that other participants in the market who have conflict of interest want them to. They avoid it. And they do everything in the opposite way to the way retail traders do it. What do dumb money do? Believe everything they're told and rely on the infrastructure provided to them by financial market participants with conflict of interest. Believe that the infrastructure has been built for their benefit when it's actually been built for the opposite purpose. They trade in the way that they're told to trade and they do everything in the opposite way to the way professional traders do it. But there's a catch. We talked about it earlier with the non-farm payrolls example. That's very typical. Smart money requires dumb money to exist. Who's supplying the credit facility? The investment banks. Who's the perfect broker? The one that peddles the narrative. Who's the perfect client? The client that believes the narrative. And it creates the negative feedback loop and the professional traders win. <laughs>